You're welcome, and let's just come to God in prayer. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, although there are a few of us here tonight, we thank you that you are here, and we thank you that what we do is still a very sacred and solemn and wonderful thing as we come to look at your word. And we pray that uh, you would send your Holy Spirit to give us understanding, because uh, this is a book which is not a man-made book, it's a divine book, it's a holy book, uh, one that the Holy Spirit himself caused to be written as men were carried along uh, by his power. And so we pray that as we meet around your word tonight, that you would teach us uh, and change us, that this word be no mere theoretical exercise, but rather that it would be something that would do us good, and that it would change us, empower us, and help us to live to please you uh, all the better. So we pray that you would come amongst us now and bless us, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, can I invite you to turn to the second chapter of Haggai? Uh, we uh, had a couple of looks at this book, and uh, we're now going to uh, look at chapter 2, uh, the first uh, nine verses. Haggai chapter 2 verse 1 In the seventh month, on the twenty-first of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Well, we're given very precise dates by Haggai all the way through this prophecy. Uh, and the date of this prophecy, we're told, is the 27th, sorry, 21st uh, day of the seventh month and according to uh, uh, the best scholars this is something like the 17th of October 15 to 520 BC so that's significant because there's been about a month uh, between the time of the first sorry the second and third prophecy and it's a busy time of year for the normal Jewish calendar uh, you have the feast of trumpets on the first day of the seventh month uh, this was a day when no work was to be done. Then on the 10th day of the 7th month came the Day of Atonement. On the 15th day of the month was the Feast of Tabernacles, which was the week-long festival. Uh, and so this prophecy seems to come at the end of that feast. Uh, so as you know, the Feast of Tabernacles was people had to move out of their houses and go and live in booths to remember their forefathers uh, who journeyed through the wilderness uh, with Moses. So when Haggai is talking here in, in chapter 2, uh, he is reminding uh, us, or giving the setting to our, uh, the readers, that these three feasts, or these three Sabbaths, have all come apart uh, in this short time. So there hasn't been too much work. And of course, it would not have been lost, I don't think, on Haggai, having already told the people off for living in their lovely panelled houses and going out and building all their building, uh, you know, just at the time they're in the booths 
Uh, they're in these sort of temporary things. I remember one of my um, children that I taught, his mum was Jewish, and uh, we were talking about how they keep it now. And uh, she said, well, we live in a flat, so we actually build a little uh, tent out of <coughs> wood and, and branches on our balcony. Uh, and we sleep outside in that. And uh, so even in all sorts of circumstances, uh, this little feast, this feast was remembered. This rather important feast uh, was remembered. So there hadn't actually been much work done um, between the first and the second, because, uh, uh, sorry, between the second and the third prophecy, because of all of these feasts. But as the people were coming to the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, as they were still living in their booths, they'd had these days of rest, then they would have been able to do what perhaps you do when you're on holiday, if you go on holiday. Um, you know, when we're on holiday, we often think, well, when I get back, you know, I'm going to do this, uh, or I'm not going to do this. You know, I'm going to sort my life out. I'm going to get things done. I'm going to change the way I do things. Uh, perhaps it's just me that thinks that on holiday, but uh, if that's you, well, you're in good company. Because I think this is what these are doing here. They're sitting here in their booths, uh, not working, uh, not uh, doing very much but thinking about the future and this task that's been given to them and uh, maybe in their minds they're laying their plans well how actually are we going to do this um, who's skilled in this and who's skilled in that and what can I do and so on and in the midst of all of that Haggai the prophet stands up and gives them this great message uh, of encouragement but uh, it is still going to be a difficult work first of all as we've said there's been this delay from the last prophecy to this they haven't really been able to get stuck in over this last month but uh, not only is there this delay but secondly there's also the decay I want you to try and think for a moment it's very difficult for us we've never seen the temples unless you've been to Israel uh, or you've seen mock-ups and things like that it's very difficult to actually imagine what it must have been like for these people in Haggai's time uh, for the very old, uh, who are mentioned uh, in our passage, they would have remembered the glory of Solomon's temple. Uh, this was a, a temple made with marble, overlaid with gold. They would have had uh, bronze lavers, the, the big fire where the sacrifices were, were uh, looked at. Uh, all the articles that were used, you know, forks and spoons and all sorts, they were made out of pure gold. Uh, there was hammered gold uh, shields, there was hammered gold swords, there was all sorts of incredible uh, furniture all overlaid with either pure gold um, or if it was something to be used uh, with hammered gold. Uh, brass was counted as nothing, silver counted as nothing. It was an incredible place to have looked at. I mean, you know, I don't know if the sun shone on the, on the gold, although the gold was inside, uh, just how, how bright this building was. But it was an incredible place but that was 70 years ago uh, it's gone and uh, it's laid uh, it's laid waste and so in its place you have still no doubt got the foundation you still got the, the maybe the, some of the steps and, and, and maybe uh, the kind of floor but it's all overgrown isn't it because you imagine I mean you know leave my garden for a week and the weeds are kind of taking over you know 70 years you know, brambles and thorns and, and all sorts of stuff. How, how much must it have been in a state of decay? Thorns and weeds and no doubt the vermin, snakes and rats living in, this, in the holes that they burrowed uh, over these years. And as the people began to dig and scrape away and get rid of the weeds and get rid of the thistles and clear out the vermin, they must have felt what a daunting task this was. We've got to rebuild this place. Uh, and, and how are we going uh, to do it? And so they would be looking at the carcass uh, of the old temple to see what they could do. Uh, they would need to get new rock, new uh, quarried uh, building stone and so on, and then they had to get building. And it was very, very clear from the outset that there was no way that they were going to get the building looking as it was. They simply didn't have the money. You know, Solomon, had been you know bequeathed you know in our language millions of pounds worth of stuff ready you know he didn't really have to do a lot except actually do the building david had been laying in the wood and the gold and the, and the precious stones and all these other things for years these people had nothing 
So they were going to start on something that they knew was going to be nowhere near what it was and what they'd like it to be. I mean, how discouraging is that? If you were thinking about a project, whatever it might be, whether it be decorating your kitchen or changing your bathroom, and you knew that after all the effort you are going to put in, it was going to look nowhere near as good as it used to, you'd be very discouraged, wouldn't you? And so they had delay uh, and they had uh, decay uh, as uh, there were these difficulties in building the temple. Uh, but then secondly, there was discouragement in building the temple. If we have a look at verse 3, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? If we look at Ezra 3 verse 12, uh, we'll see that, that there really was, when it was finished, real sadness. Uh, what we might call old tears. These, these old men, these old women who'd seen the building were in tears when the building, what the new building was finished. Uh, it was not uh, merely as, 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 as Sol Solomon written in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 10 that these were just people who were living in the past. They, they really were genuine, uh, genuinely sad. And I imagine that they were probably bewildered. It would have been a thought saying, well, hang on a minute. Why has God brought us back here? You know, he's punished our nation. He's wiped out our royal family. He sent us off into exile. Most of the Jewish people have stayed in exile. We're the remnant here. We're only a tiny little fraction of all that have stayed. And, and we've been given this task, a really hard task. What is God doing? Must have been a question on their lips, wasn't it? And, and also, perhaps when they looked at Ezekiel 44, um, when Ezekiel kind of has this vision where he's drawing out the dimensions of the new temple. Now, although it was meant to be a spiritual uh, prophecy, then there no doubt would have been uh, a temptation to have looked at that as a, as a physical one. Oh, there's this new building, it's going to be great. But in fact, the new building wasn't great. And perhaps they imagined that, that the king would give um, gold and silver. After all, he plundered it in the first place, or his predecessors has. Perhaps they would you know, send all the gold back. Perhaps they'd help them quarry marble and all those things. Perhaps the king would provide great men of skill like Solomon had. But as the time drew near to build, and as the building began, and as it came to a close, it was very, very obvious this was going to be no temple of magnificence. This was going to be a poor temple. It didn't even have the ark in it. It didn't have the cherubim on it. It didn't have the Urim and the Thummim in it. It had no Shekinah glory that Solomon had. There was no sacred fire falling down from heaven consuming the sacrifices. And they must have been asking themselves, is God with us or not? Is this something that he really wants to be built or is this a figment of our imagination? Because who's telling us to get up and build this? Well, Haggai and Zechariah, you know, are these men for real? The best that we can build is surely nothing more than an insult to the glory and power and majesty of God. The people worked as hard as they could, but they had to realise at the end that their best just wasn't enough. And in comparison, of course, all the other nations were much stronger. Uh, and this temple was never going to be the symbol of power that Solomon's temple was. And so we read that uh, they were broken hearted. They were uh, saying this new temple is as nothing. But then we have divine encouragement to build the temple. And the Lord in verses 4 to 8 gives them three promises. Three promises. Uh, and he says, first of all, he says, I am going to give you my presence. I'm going to give you my presence. God promises to be with his people whenever he asks them to work for him. No doubt the enemy of their souls was telling the people in their hearts that God had abandoned them in Babylon, uh, that he was still angry with them, that he still was casting them off. Um, and, uh, you know, since their best efforts could only be puny, surely the judgment of God still hung over them for their idolatry. This new temple would never ever be the same or even in the same league as the old one. 
but promises that were made to kings and priests and judges uh, and men of old were the same promises that were now being made to the people. Verse 4, he says, be strong. Uh, the Hebrew word korzak means to fasten upon or to seize. We say sometimes seize the day. This was something to be grabbed. The temple was not going to build itself. They were and they had to get a grip and work hard. But as they began the work and as they continued with the work, the Lord says, I will be with you. My presence will be with you. And that's an encouragement tonight for us, isn't it? That even though it looks such a small congregation, the Lord is with us his presence is with us every bit as it was all those days before secondly the lord says um i will give you my money or we're talking about the lord's money verse 8 the silver is mine and the gold is mine what's that all about well the lord is saying don't concern yourself about the gold and silver because i don't need them to display my glory yes the other temple had it and the other temple had it to the absolute nth degree but this is going to be a different glory solomon's temple physically may have prefigured my glory but that's not the only way i show my glory yes God, if he wants to, can raise up the greatest kings and the greatest buildings and all of that can show his glory. But in this case, God is saying, I'm going to show my glory in a different way. And the people would say, well, how are you going to do that then, Lord, if it's going to be such a poor building? Well, the third thing he says is, um, I will give you my, the third thing rather is my temple. So God promises his presence, his money, and his temple. Go back in your mind to the prophecy of Daniel. In that book, we read that God foretells that there will be four kingdoms. And they'll all be military kingdoms. They are known for their great military power and prowess. And they're told in advance. Daniel is told in advance what those kingdoms will be. And they're told them by the symbols of the animals that they are notified by. So you have Babylon, you have Persia, you have Greece, and you have Rome. And then, Daniel is told, Rome will fall and the new kingdom will come, which will not be military. It will be a different sort of kingdom. And of course, we know that that's the New Testament church, which starts at the death and resurrection of the Lord's anointed and will finish when the Son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven. But now we're in Haggai's day, where are we in that timeline? Well, we're right in the middle of it. The kingdom of Babylon has come and has gone. You will know that uh, the story um, that, that Belshazzar was, was slain and the kingdom was passed over to Persia, or more accurately, the Medes and the Persians. And uh, this kingdom, the second kingdom, was now in place. And so the prophecy of Daniel could be seen to be coming true. And it was something that God was doing. He foretold it would happen and he has brought it to pass. He brought in this incredible kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, and that was prophesied not just to Daniel, of course, that was prophesied to Isaiah and Jeremiah, and all the prophets. But it's now gone. This incredibly powerful kingdom in one night has just gone. That is how God can work. The seemingly impregnable kingdom of Babylon is no more. The second kingdom is here. Two more kingdoms will come and then there'll be one more shaking and the kingdom of heaven will come. This temple you build, he says, will last until that kingdom comes. That is why the glory of the latter house that you're building, uh, this seemingly insignificant thing, is going to be greater than the glory of Solomon's temple. Why? Because the greater uh, the spiritual is greater than the physical. What God makes is always better than what man makes. Jesus illustrates that, doesn't he, when he says that the glory of Solomon, for all of its magnificence, was not as wonderful as the lily in the field that God had made. We can't make a lily, can we? We can't make it grow, but a temple we can. But a temple is not a living thing. The greatest that man can accomplish is not as glorious as one dot in God's creation. And so after this shaking, the desire of nations will come. Who or what is this desire of nations? Uh, you, you know that uh, that phrase is in one of Wesley's Christmas hymns, Come, desire of nations, come. 
But of course, in a sense, Jesus wasn't the desire of nations when he came, was he? Because as Isaiah quite correctly, correctly says, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He said to the people after the Sermon on the Mount finished, when a man says, I'll follow you anywhere, no doubt inspired by this amazing sermon. He says, well, I, you know, I couldn't know where to live. Foxes have holes, you know, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. He was not, uh, outwardly speaking, uh, the desire of all nations. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The word desire here is a plural verb and has a plural subject. And so it's often better to render this phrase uh, that the treasure of all the nations will come. In other words, the spiritual treasure that the Lord Jesus brought. The nations themselves are going to be shaken up. They're going to be stirred by that same spirit that stirred you from this place, which you are tempted to despise. This rubbish looking temple that you're building will come peace and glory and worship. It will come the treasure spiritual treasure that all nations will bring because from this house from this place will come peace to all the nations not peace that the man has agreed not like a truce that maybe our world leaders now are trying to sort something out in uh, uh, Blenheim Palace right now as we as we're as we're meeting here it's not that kind of peace uh, this is a peace between God and man in symbolic language Haggai gives a foretaste of that spiritual realm to come, the universality of that realm to come, the desire of all nations. Yes, Jesus will be desired by people, men, women, boys and girls of all nations. Um, and that's how this promise is fulfilled. So this temple has got uh, a very important role to play, not only in the life of Israel, not just as a focal point for the worship of God in these next four or five hundred years, but into this temple and just outside of this temple is going to be the one who's offered the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world. And so it's a great encouraging passage uh, that uh, Haggai gives to these people, uh, that God gives them these promises and God tells them something of what he's going to do. Now again, how much he knew, they understood is always uh, a mute point, but it is very clear that something uh, about this temple is going to be very special in a way that perhaps people wouldn't readily understand. So we're going to close there and uh, ask ourselves some questions because there are some actual, in actual fact, some real pastoral lessons for us here uh, in this chapter. And it would be easy to just kind of skate over them and, and move on to the next bit. But I'd rather stop now uh, and just look at some of these things. Turn with me to uh, what I quoted you earlier on, which is Ecclesiastes chapter 7 uh, and verse uh, 10. And there is these words that you might find a little bit strange. Verse 10 of, of Ecclesiastes 7. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. Now, I wonder how many of us here have said or thought in some context or other it was better in the old days. It was better when this happened or that happened. It was better when life was simpler. Uh, sometimes on Facebook you get these people who say tell us something good from the 1960s or 70s or 80s or whatever it is and people will kind of reminisce about what was great about those times. But Solomon is the one who is writing these words. I want you to notice that, okay? I want you to notice that. He says, don't say, why are the former times better? Because that's not a wise thing to do. But the fact of the matter is, if you and I uh, have been around a long time, we moan and we groan. And one of the things that we often say is, it was better in the former days. So this is not a new thing here. Haggai's people were saying it, weren't they? They were saying, this temple is nowhere near as good as the last one was. The worship of God uh, and the, the life of Israel with, with no royal family and no proper priesthood and no ark and no uh, Urim and Thummim and no, none of these things. It, it can't be as good as it was. That's, that's what they're saying. But of course, who's writing these verses in Ecclesiastes? It's Solomon. You see, if there was ever a golden age, 
uh, in the life of Israel, surely it was the age when Solomon was king. But Solomon is writing these words and he says, even in my day, they're saying things were better in the past. And you think, well, how can that possibly be? <laughs> you've, got, you've got an established monarchy. You've got more land than you've ever had before or you ever will have again. You've got riches in abundance. You've got security. You've got everything. How can it possibly be better in the former days? And you can read about that uh, in, in the early chapters of Kings and Chronicles. And yet Ecclesiastes that Solomon writes teaches people were still saying even then it was better in the old days. But the, the fact of the matter is, Solomon says, it isn't true. It's never true. Now, the only thing I can think of is perhaps the people of Solomon's day were moaning about their taxes. Because if you look in 1 Kings 12 verse 4, that's what they come to complain about when Rehoboam is made king. But Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, has says uh, it is not a wise thing to say it's better in the old days. Tempting, but it's not wise. Why is it not wise? Well, because what we're really saying is God somehow is letting us down. God somehow has either lost the will or the power to look after us as he looked after them. It was good then. God blessed us then, but he's not now. And so we're kind of charging God with unfaithfulness. We're kind of charging God with uh, hanging on, hanging back from the blessings that he has promised. But also, how can we make that judgment properly anyway? Because even if we were alive in the old days, we weren't old enough perhaps to be wise. We're certainly wiser now. And of course, when we look back on decisions we've made or when we look back on things that have happened, as we say, 2020 vision is great in hindsight, isn't it? Um, but the fact is, uh, we cannot really judge our own, even our own mistakes and choices in the light of today's circumstances. We could only do what we could do at that particular time. And so to moan about the old days is to imply that God is less able or willing to bless us now. But the truth is, God always loves his people doesn't he he loves them the same god is always in charge god is always perfecting his plan god loves his people deeply he protects them fiercely and he does it exactly the same now as he did then god has not changed and so to imply or to say it was better then than it is now is to do great dishonor to god uh, and it's also uh, really showing that we're not wise because we don't know all the facts because we cannot we're too small and so the first lesson from this uh, story of Haggai is let's be a grateful people let's be a thankful people let's not look at the past with as we say rose-colored spectacles and say it was always better then because God is still in charge and God is still doing what God has determined to do now the second lesson from this passage, and we probably could have looked at this at another time, but uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, if you could have a look at that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. Now Elijah covered, us, covered this subject for us on a, on a Sunday morning, um, but I think it's worth just having a little look here and uh, I'm not going to say too much because uh, I'm going to touch on this a little bit on Sunday morning to come um, but in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 uh, Paul is writing well actually we'll, we'll look at verse 10 uh, according to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another builds on it but let each one take heed how he builds on it for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay straw each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is if anyone's work which you has built on it endures he will receive a reward if anyone's work is burned he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved as 
yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now we could spend a lot of time on there, but the simple question is we need to see this passage in the context of Haggai. What is the temple of God today? What does Paul say is the temple of God today? It says it's us. It's us as individuals. Uh, Paul is, the temple of God is often thought as, of as the whole national universal worldwide church. And I'm not going to decry that, but Paul here is emphasising that it is every believer. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to say exactly the same thing. We are a temple of God as individuals and we are to build our temple. To build is to live or to live is to build. So how do we do that? Well, going back to the time of Haggai, they had to sweat, didn't they? They had to work hard, they had to plan, they had to obtain, they had to do a lot of stuff. They had to overcome discouragement to get that building up. What was the building for? To worship God in, to offer sacrifices in, to pray in, to be taught in. And all of those things are in our temple, says Paul. 3 verse 11 he says you don't have to worry about the offering for sin you don't have to worry about all of that that's been done by Jesus Christ that's the foundation but now we build on that foundation Jesus Christ has made for us the base of a temple our lives now are going to build a temple and so the work we do for Christ for his kingdom for his people for his gospel we are building that temple of worship for him because that's our life our life is to be a temple of worship for God and he will protect us uh, we're told that very clearly in here if anyone who defiles the temple of God God will destroy him we often say well how much does God love us how much will God protect us well there's a verse to hang on to until that temple is built and it's time to go home God will be with us and then thirdly from this passage of Haggai you notice in verse 5 that God says uh, do not fear do not fear I might say well that's easy for you to say Haggai why would naturally the people of God not fear well we said it up to a point already they were outnumbered they were weak they were vulnerable they had no one to protect them there was no police there was no army they had enemies all around. There was lots of people, we can see that emphasised in the book of Nehemiah, can't we? Who really didn't want the temple built. Who didn't want the walls built. Who didn't want Israel to exist. Not really changed today, has it? They were poor. They seemed so insignificant in the eyes of everybody else in the empire. And so they had every reason to be afraid, humanly speaking, didn't they? And of course it's the same with the Christian and the church, isn't it? In this country, as in most countries of the world, we are in a, a real tiny minority. But to the world, we look weak, insignificant, poor and vulnerable. Who is there to protect us when the world gets nasty? No one. Yet God says to his people and to us throughout the Bible, not just here, do not be afraid. Why? Because I am with you we see it in joshua 1 we see it in the psalms we see it in mark chapter 6 remember that story when jesus is in the storm uh, and uh, he gets in the boat and he goes why are you afraid why did you fear now the fact that haggai is saying to us don't be afraid tells us that there are times in our life when we are naturally afraid there's, there's nothing to be ashamed of there. Christians are not to be sort of like super stoic or anything like that. With the psalmist, we can say, whenever I am afraid, so he is afraid, there is fear, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. And so Haggai is echoing this theme that runs throughout the Bible. Trust me, God says, I will look after you. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. 
When we read these words, the Spirit remains in us, it means to stand with us or to abide with us. Uh, and Jesus echoed that in uh, John 14 and John 15. Uh, in every one of his children, the Holy Spirit abides. The Holy Spirit reminds every one of his children of the promises that the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. It reminds us that the Lord is our helper. So when we are afraid, come to God with your fears. Reverently ask him to keep his promise. Ask him to take away your fear and help you in the present trial. The fact is he will do that because he is promised. Uh, and then fourthly, and kind of the other side of the coin to this one, is uh, strength. You can see that all these points are inextricably linked. As I say, they're, they're really two sides of one coin. Verse 4, uh, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong, all you people. When anything's ever said three times in the uh, scriptures, you know that it is of great significance. So the other side of do not fear is be strong, isn't it? But how can a Christian be strong? It's not something you can kind of magic up, isn't it? Or just conjure up uh, inside you. So what do we have to do? Well, there is an effort to that. There is some work that we've got to do. We've got to do the being strong. It's up to us to do that. So as we've already noted, the word means to fasten upon or to seize upon. It carries the idea of building a fortress. So how do we become strong in our bodies? Well, we... We exercise, don't we? We have discipline and we get up and we go for a run or for a bike ride or do whatever else people do. How do we become mentally strong? Well, it's the same, isn't it? We exercise and we discipline. We read, we study, we write, we think and, and so on. And you can see where this is going, can't you? How do we become spiritually strong? Well, we exercise and we are disciplined. We must spiritually work. We must read our scriptures. We must talk with our saviour. We must use the gifts that he's given us. We must strengthen the brothers and be strengthened by the brothers. Satan will tell us that we are useless and we have no gifts. But the Bible says that we each have gifts that God gives us to use. What we often lack is desire or motivation or self-discipline. Uh, that's the hard part, isn't it, of being strong. Now the result of this, as we know, is Haggai's little remnant changed their land they built their temple they prepared the way for the savior uh, and our job also is to change our land build our temples and prepare the way for the lord to return a second time the question is as jesus kind of says to the people in the temple uh, will we be about our father's business haggai encourages us to be strong and do so amen